So this is our, uh, again, fifth in a series of salt and sea salinity webinars. This one focusing on, again, the salinity at the salt and sea. Um, this video is being recorded, and this webinar is being recorded, um, and will be posted uh, after, shortly after uh, today at this website shown below. Um, some key questions on uh, why we're looking at salinity here at the Salton Sea. Um, as we know, water quantity and water quality affect projects being built at the Salton Sea. Salton Sea is currently uh, enjoying a salinity, uh, species conservation habitat at the, salt, at the south end of the Salton Sea, a uh, roughly 4,000 acre, $200 million project, which is directly effect, affected both by the quantity and quality of water flowing into that. Um, the target salinity range of that project is in the, in the range of 20 to 40 grams per liter of salt. Uh, salinity inflows, as we'll hear from uh, the panelists, typically range uh, from about two to three grams per liter, but the salinity of the uh, salt and sea itself is about 70, about twice the salinity of the, of the ocean. Um, so the, for these projects, they're mixing, or the idea is to mix water from uh, inflows in salt and sea water to pump water back from the remnant salt and sea or increasingly becoming a brine pool to reach that target salinity. But there's a lot of unanswered questions and we're gonna hear from the panelists um, some of the answers to these questions is uh, how lower inflows dilute the salinity of the salt and sea, how the salts uh, that are flowing into the salt and sea tend to drop out of solution or precipitate, and then uh, what, what it means to bring in additional water and how that might affect uh, salinity at the salt and sea. Um, let me pull this other file up here. Oh. Um, my apologies while I pull this up. So the, we have a panel of experts um, whose bios I had and kind of trouble pulling up. All right, well, my apologies. Uh, so uh, a distinguished panel of experts who I unfortunately had their bios up, but uh, Dr. Montezar uh, is with uh, the UC Cooperative Extension, works extensively uh, in Imperial Valley, and uh, many years of experience in Imperial Valley, looking at origins of salts, leaching operations, and we'll speak to those. Uh, Chris Holdren, uh, worked for many years for the Bureau of Reclamation, is an expert limnologist uh, with more than 50 years of experience in the field, worked on lakes uh, throughout the world. And we'll talk to uh, some of the salt chemistry at the Salton Sea, the, the fate, uh, the salts entering the Salton Sea. Uh, Elliot Janiecki is uh, from the Utah Geological Survey. And uh, for me, the, the interest here is uh, the Great Salt Lake has a lot of analogs uh, to the Salton Sea. It's much, much saltier than, than the Salton Sea. We've seen a lot of salt um, exposed there and salinity is varied uh, and increasingly um, becoming saltier as inflows have dropped but uh, a lot of interesting salt chemistry at the Great Salt Lake and um, hoping to learn from uh, Elliot's experience up there. And Tom Sefton, again, has also worked uh, extensively at, at the Salton Sea. And we'll be speaking to uh, high salinities at the Salton Sea. Um, he's worked for many years uh, on the shores, working with vertical uh, tube, uh, um, well, sorry, sorry, working with uh, desalinators at the south end of the Salton Sea. Um, a lot of work at Desert Shores, which offers a lot of experience and um, um, on how salts are evaporating there and how that is becoming more of a brine pool. And we'll be speaking to uh, desalination options at the Salton Sea as well. So just a very quick background on, on the Salton Sea. As we know, the Salton Sea was formed uh, back in 1905 when the Colorado River, the full flow of the river flowed once again into what used to be Lake Cahuilla, an ancient salt bed. Uh, there was a salt and active salt mining operation uh, at the Salton Sea prior to the, this most recent incarnation of the lake. Uh, and this image here just shows some of that salt mining operation. So the uh, takeaway here is that uh, for many years, uh, the salt accumulated as, as lakes uh, evaporated. And then when the freshwater came back in, it became much saltier, much quicker because a lot of those salts went back into solution. Uh, this image on the left from the Bureau of Reclamation shows uh, both the volume and salinity uh, of different reaches of the Colorado River. And the image on the right uh, shows some of the salt formations in red. 
So uh, through geologic time, there were oceans where the North American continent uh, currently exists. As through uplift, those uh, oceans lost uh, their water sources, dried out, but the salts again remained as we see at the Salton Sea and Great Salt Lake and Bonneville Salt Flats and other places. So those salts, as, as uh, rivers cut through that ground, uh, leach those salts out of the ground. Uh, so there's some very salty sources within the Colorado River bringing those salts down. Some um, About 10 years ago, uh, there were some 9 million tons of salt passing Lee's Ferry, the midpoint between the upper and lower Colorado River basins. Uh, and around that time frame, about 4 million tons of salts were entering the salt sea. So some 44% of the salts uh, in the, carried by the Colorado River wound up in the sump uh, of the Salton Sea. Uh, and then uh, this is just an image of, a, of the Cargill salt ponds or the former Cargill salt ponds, uh, just showing what the hyperbrine uh, solutions look like. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Montazar to, to talk about leaching uh, in the Imperial Valley. Thank you, Michael. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think you had a very good, uh, a clear introduction, Michael, about the salt, salt and sea and salt. Uh, I would like to start with these two images in my uh, screen. I took these pictures last year. So the left side shows uh, a date palm three miles away from the salt and sea. The right side picture shows an onion field during germination just last December, I took from an onion field under drip irrigation. I think these two pictures shows and demonstrate where we are talking about and what we are talking about. Uh, when someone asked me to introduce Imperial Valley, uh, I can do that in just a couple of sentences. We have Colorado River as the main source of water. We don't have that much rain or annual rainfall is about three inches. We have a very diverse cropping system and irrigation practices. And the region is dominated by heavy soil and low organic matter. I think we need to know that. You know, If you talk about low organic matter, you should expect a lot of fertilizer be applied by growers. Uh, I think that's, that's very important point. And when we are talking about diverse cropping system and low organic matter, we should expect that. We have nearly half a million acre irrigated ag. So the region is one of the most ag production region in California. When it comes to uh, evapotranspiration, we have the highest reference evapotranspiration in this state, which means uh, we have you know, the highest crop water requirements and ap irrigation application rate uh, in, the, uh, in California. We have a very well developed drainage system, good tile system and a surface drainage canals. Uh, they, talk, they, they take all the water from Imperial Valley and Coachella Valley, uh, everything goes to Salton City. But of course, Imperial Valley is the main contribu contributor here because uh, you know, about 85% of the total inflow to Salton City goes from Imperial, which means we should expect about 85% of the salt goes to the salt and sea also goes from Imperial Valley. When it comes to Colorado River water as the main water, we know about you know, the water quality uh, of Colorado. We have a very high calcium, sodium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, sulfate, and of course, high pH. That's all Colorado River. I believe this is not a bad water. You know, in, if we use this water in North California, we don't have that much issues because we have rain and we don't need even to leach it. You know, this is not a bad, a bad uh, irrigation water because the classification says uh, all water in, in Imperial is a per, uh, permissible water. If we use this water for irrigation, we need some leaching. We also need a good drainage system. We have this in Imperial Valley, I think, and we need, uh, to uh, have both. But I would like to mention this. This is, I think, very important. During the last five, six years, uh, I did survey several fields. I took about you know, more than 1,000 soil samples. That sample says to me, what we have, you know, the issue we have in the desert and Imperial Valley is 
serenity. We have serenity hazard, not sodium hazard. In part of the, the orchard we have in, you know, close to Salton Sea, we have some, some sodium issues, but uh, the major issue is about, you know, salinity or saline soil, not uh, sodic soil, which is good news, I believe. This is the soil salinity map for three uh, date palm. The date palm one is in Coachella. In Coachella, we have sandy soil. You obviously see there is no salinity issue at all. The date palm two is next in winter heaven, next to Yuma area. Again, not a big deal for, for, for a crop like date palm, you know, is below threshold for, for date palm. When it goes to date palm tree, is three miles away from the Salton Sea. That's huge salt effect. Trinity, this is permitted, is about one quarter of the Salton Sea water quality. This is another map uh, of, of EC for uh, onion field under drip, uh, drip irrigation. This is one, one of the issues we have in the desert. In one field, we have a very high variability, soil variability. If you look at this field, in the west side, we don't have salinity issue. In the east side, we have salinity issue. So what a grower needs to do, I think this is one of the mistakes a grower might do. We don't need leaching in the west side, but we need leaching in the east side, and they need to take care of these things. When we look at the salinity, in the soil profile, it's very interesting result. So here I have com comparison for a field under drip and other under furrow and other uh, under uh, uh, sprinkler irrigation. They have different soil type, but they all have uh, onion. Onion is one of the most sensitive crop we have in the desert uh, to salinity. So if you look at the top soil in the drip, it's very soft affected. It means some of the irrigation system contribute to salinity issues like subsurface drip irrigation on the top left. On, on the bottom left, I have photo irrigated. This photo irrigated is, you know, has some drainage issue, but it's still the salinity is, is lower than drip irrigated. It obviously means drip irrigation has some contribution to salinity issue in the desert. You know, if a grower has a drip irrigated, they need to do something different, you know, different management for salt. When it goes to fine sandy soil with a sprinkler, there is no salinity issue at all. I think what our growers need to do, we cannot deal with salinity issue in the same way, you know, for different crops, different soil type, different irrigation system. I think we need to, to think about that uh, more uh, precisely. But summer leaching is the common practice to manage salt in Imperial Valley. All growers use spring irrigation and also flood irrigation or flood irrigation to manage salt. Uh, what they do, and this is in the real number during the last six years, I hope, you know, uh, we, this, this is not from the book, this is from my research. All growers apply anywhere from 0.5 or half an acre feet per acre to one acre food per acre excessive water during summer, mostly during August and September to leach the salt accumulated uh, in the soil profile. I think if you work with, with water, we know about this. You know, we know uh, what does that mean, one acre food? One acre food is about 325 gallons. It can meet the annual water needs of one to two families of four people. Of course, that's a lot of water. But if you also, we want to maintain the salt in this valley and keep productivity high, we also need to, to apply, you know, some, some uh, water for leaching, but we can optimize. We always can optimize and think about, uh, you know, optimization of that uh, leach. This is one of the toughest project I have ever uh, uh, did in desert because we did this in, in uh, July, August and September. We selected several fields. We went to the field to survey the salinity, the entire soil profile before leaching and after leaching. We went to the exact location with the GPS we had. So if you can, if you look at these pictures, it is, these figures obviously shows, the red line shows before leaching. The blue lines shows the salinity after leaching. It means this, you know, the, the, the leaching is a very effective tool for our growers. You know, there is no doubt on it. Sometimes 
it, it, you know, the salinity declines from about nine decisimen per, per meter on the top soil to about three decisimen or two and a half or one and a half decisimen per meter. But this is not always, you know, works for every, every field. This is another field. I have the data shows uh, this field has some drain, drainage issue. Of course, when we did leaching, we, we washed down salt from the top soil. We, br we brought it down to about, you know, 20 inches uh, depth. But below that, we have some salt accumulation because the drainage system doesn't work effectively. We just, you know, leach down the salt from the top soil to the, to the down, but we didn't clean the entire soil for a while here. Uh, this is also one of the collection one of our growers has in Imperial Valley. So he, he ha, he's in this business, ag business, over 28 years. Every time he did some maintenance for his uh, uh, drainage system, he found some object, and now he has a collection. This is the collection. This is the objects he found inside the drain tile system over 28 years. I believe one of these objects is enough to clog the, the tile system entirely. So that's why, you know, some part of the field, we, we see some salt affected even with drainage system because the drainage system doesn't work effectively. So I'm encouraging all growers to this statement. We, you know, maintenance of the drainage system as important as having drainage system. We cannot just establish the drainage system and just walk away. Otherwise, this is, you know, the, the, the issues we can see it. So I work in the, in the uh, you know, uh, in the desert region of, of uh, Middle East. So I have some 10 years of professional experience from the Middle East and about 11 years in California and several years in the desert region. As an irrigation specialist, I believe land productivity is highly depending on the effectiveness of salinity management. We believe to that, you know, all the literature believe to that. Salinity reduces the actual crop water use, and as a result, can reduce the yield production. This is just example in the desert, two field, onion field, the same planting time, the same field. Part of the field that in the right side has some salinity issue. The left side is not salt affected, you know, uh, onion. Very healthy, good growth. In the right side, we don't, you know, we had even some germination issues uh, because of the salinity issue. So at the end of season, we observed 25% yield reduction in the part salt affected. I don't give the all bad credit to salinity, but the major part that major part of that yield reduction comes from the salinity. Uh, it's about 10 miles away from the salt and sea, that field. Uh, I believe leaching is the most effective tool or growers, they have it in, in the desert region. But we also need to know the optimal, you know, perhaps not, I cannot defend or growers, they do the optimal strategy. We always can do a better job because the optimal strategy depends on many factors, irrigation practices, soil types, cropping system. We need to consider all those uh, parameters and, and do a better job in the future. I think, in the future, perhaps we don't have, you know, the water one acre food per acre to, to use it for leaching. Or growers need to decide because the irrigation district says, this is your water. You can put it all for leaching or produce your, your, your crop. So they need to make a tough decision in the future. So how they want to do leaching. Some growers now, even they think leaching every other year. I don't know what will be happen, you know, if they do that. But I think we all know, we all need to work together to go with optimal strategy, but it's still leaching stay as the most effective tool for all growers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and just a quick note to the audience, uh, you can post your questions in the, under the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And panelists will answer the questions uh, via the, the live answer or, or via the typed answer. Um, and then we'll also be taking questions at the end of all the presentations. Uh, Ali, I think there's a question for you in, uh, in the Q&A right now. Uh, and moving along to Chris.
We will once I can get unmuted there. I'm going to be talking about the Bureau of Reclamation monitoring at the Salton Sea. I was, okay, as soon as I back up here a slide or two. That's probably good enough. A lot of agencies have monitored salts in the sea over the past several decades. Uh, Reclamation looked at it a few times. We really started intensively in 1999 when EPA funded a very intensive program with studies in all aspects of the sea. Uh, my group studied it. We were out there, I think, 18 times over the course of the year. Starting again in 2004, Reclamation continued to monitor for salts and other variables approximately quarterly. Uh, in recent years, we haven't quite made all the quarters because it's being increasingly hard to launch boats as the levels decrease. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the data collected by the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, here's where our sampling sites were. We've got sites in each of the two deep basins, one on the saddle. Uh, we see very few differences between the three major sampling sites from top to bottom. Uh, really, the only differences are around the edges where the rivers come in. The, there may be slight changes in chemistry, but these three sites give us the bulk of the water in the sea, so we think it's a very good representation of what's going on. You know, this is fairly important. This is the level. Uh, USGS started monitoring daily level, reporting daily levels of the sea in October of two, 1987. For roughly the first eight or 15 years, it was fairly constant. But then, as you can see in recent years, it started to drop off fairly dramatically. Uh, we're down now to roughly minus 239 or 240. It had been minus 228 for a number of years. Uh, these are the salts in the sea. Uh, Total dissolved solids, it can be measured both uh, gravimetrically and by adding the sums of the major ions. So usually the two methods agree fairly well. There's a couple of outliers here. Uh, at very high salt levels, the water can be occluded within the salt matrix. And so occasionally the gravimetric method will give erroneously high levels. I see a low level here with the sum of the ions, which looks suspicious because it is marching been marching higher pretty steadily. So there are differences. We've had a number of different labs, so that's also a possible reason for changes. In 2006, uh, Michael and the Pacific Institute published something called Hazard, which showed what might happen to the sea in the absence of the um, in the absence of any restoration efforts. You can see here we're down in this region. Uh, you can see the actual in the Current, I can't because my screen's blocked from them, but as you can see, it's pretty close. The elevation, the actual level is just a few feet better than the prediction. Uh, salinity is just about right on track. And as you can see, we're still here in the early parts of the expected changes. So it could be getting much worse very, very quickly as we go on from here. Uh, comparing salt and seawater to seawater, see it's much saltier to begin with. Uh, 34,000 for seawater. 1999, the Salton Sea was at 44. Now it's at 67, again, from the sum of the ions. Uh, 2020 was the last date that I had data for the Salton Sea, unlike the elevation, which was 2022. Uh, you can see everything's been increasing over that time. The big thing to notice here is the sulfate. Uh, you start off with four times roughly as much as seawater. It keeps increasing. Colorado River Basin has a lot of sulfate in it. So that is the biggest change between seawater chemistry and salt and seawater. Uh, you can also see everything else follows pretty well in terms of the order of dominance. Big thing to notice here is calcium. Calcium has not increased over the last 20 years. It's actually maybe a slight decrease. And I'll get into that in a few minutes here. And, and here's what it looks like if you compare the major items. You can see uh, chloride and sulfate here on top, sodium on the bottom, potassium and bicarbonate. Carbonate are pretty much very minor. Down here at the bottom, we have calcium, which you can see has pretty much been steady over the course of the past 20 years, slight increases in magnesium. And this is just to, due to the different solubilities of the salts, which could be precipitating out. For the most part, sodium ion and potassium 
chlorides are all very, very soluble up to very high salinities. Calcium can be taken out by a couple of different ions and precipitation processes, as can sulfate, but there's not nearly enough calcium to have much of an impact on the sulfates. We use two different models to look at what would happen to the salt and sea is both what could be controlling solubility. This was in, done in 1999, so it's a little out of date, but I really don't think the results would have changed too much between now and then. Uh, Greek C is a very good equilibrium model. It's been verified up through the salinity of sea level, but at the salt and sea, it gave, gave very good agreement with Greek pits, which was designed for a, to work even in very highly saline systems. And the two gave very similar results. Uh, Freak C had more mineral phases that we could look at, so that was why we used it. Uh, here's what you see. Uh, salt and sea is currently super saturated with calcite, the calcium carbonate, gypsum, calcium sulfate, as well as possibly magnesium carbonate and dolomite. Uh, just because the program says that the salt and sea is super saturated, it doesn't mean those minerals will be precipitating out. Uh, kinetics and other factors can influence that. Uh, for instance, uh, dolomite. Lots of lakes predict that dolomite will precipitate, and it never does. Nobody finds dolomite precipitating out of a lake. Uh, magnesite, the magnesium carbonate, possible, but not really all that likely, just because calcium carbonate is going to precipitate first and be the most likely. Gypsum, we know, is precipitating in the sea. It's forming and should be getting more, more and more important. The thing to remember here, if you look back, we had the 400 milligrams per liter of calcium. The most that could take out is about 1,000 milligrams per liter of sulfate. So it's any precipitation that we're going to see in the near future is going to have very minimal impacts on the salinity of the sea. We're just not going to be taking out enough gypsum and calcite to do anything really to the overall salinities. You know, we, we could use the models to compare lab results to the model if we evaporated salt and seawater. And as you can see, uh, really good results up to 200, 200 grams per liter of TDS. We're still in the range of 70. So we haven't approached the levels of divergence yet. Uh, gypsum, as I said, we know that it's forming. Uh, a lot of investigators have observed the gypsum crystals during the 1999 studies. Uh, they're visible in three different groups reported to me that they were seeing them when I said I thought it was precipitating. Evaporation pond studies that were conducted by the Bureau of Reclamation also showed that zip, gypsum would precipitate, but the salinity had to increase by about 20% over the 1999 levels before it became significant. Uh, it would become very super saturated in those experiments before it would start to come out. It had to increase by 20% over the 1999 levels, but we reached that 10 years ago. So we are definitely in the range where gypsum should be readily precipitating out of solution, which could be why our calcium isn't going up, but it doesn't mean that it's really going to have much of an impact on the overall salinity of the sea. And uh, here's, the here's the reactions that are going chemically. Whoops, back up here. Don't want to show you my good slide here. <laughs> uh, the calcium will react readily with the bicarbonate to form the calcite. Uh, gypsum precipitation, as you can see, one mole of calcium, one mole of sulfate. And gypsum forms, we are there. Here's the two interesting ones. Uh, sulfate reduction. Sulfate will react with organic matter to form hydrogen sulfide and happens very quickly. During this process, we form bicarbonate as well, which could be precipitating, but again, it's minor compared to what we see. We don't see changes in the sea. Here's the big one that has an impact. Uh, most of the salt and sea is anoxic, below three meters, which means at depth, all of the sulfate essentially is going to be converted to hydrogen sulfide. What's interesting is hydrogen sulfide will precipitate out nearly all of the heavy metals. Uh, selenium is of concern, but we don't see selenium at high levels in the sea. We don't see, for instance, cadmium. Any of the bad heavy metals, anything on the EPA priority pollutant list is actually below the standards because sulfide is taking the metals out. Here's where it gets a little more serious. 
when the sulfide mixes or meets oxygen, it will almost instantly be transformed into sulfate. That's where we will see the gypsum start to precipitate out. Uh, for a number of years, and we'll go to the next one here, uh, local residents had mentioned green tides that would form. And the green tides would be associated with fish kills, but no one really knew why. Uh, back again as part of the out, one of the outcomes of those reconnaissance studies was Stuart Herbert and his group at San Diego State were able to obtain this satellite imagery and see what was going on. These green areas are gypsum. Uh, this is where the sulfide comes up during a mixing event. It instantly forms calcium sulfide or gypsum and precipitates out. That forms very small gypsum crystals, which are then reflected in the water. And that's what you see here. Uh, we were actually out during one of these events. And uh, although it's called a green tide and looks green here, it was more of a bluish green color. It was a color that I'd never seen before in a lake. I knew it wasn't an algae bloom, which had been one of the suspected causes prior to this, but it's very clear on the satellite imagery how extensive this occurs. You can see any of these areas, fish are going to die. Uh, we were actually out during one of these events, as I said, it was fine till about noon, and then all of a sudden this is what we saw everywhere that we looked on the sea, there were dead fish popping up. It was estimated that during this particular event, 10, 10 million fish died in the salt and sea is the effect of one of those mixing blooms where the gypsum precipitated out, but also where the sulfide took out the oxygen along with it. So this is what one of the impacts is. If we look at the river solids, uh, you can see there's, they're kind of bouncing up and down. The Alamo River slightly lower at the end, Whitewater River. Um, other thing, big thing to hear is Alamo's roughly 2,000 milligrams per liter, New River's 2,500 maybe, uh, Whitewater River much lower, draining the Coachella Valley into the north, so lower concentrations and also much lower flows. So most of the salts are coming in at the south end through the New and Alamo Rivers, again, draining the Imperial Valley at fairly high levels, again, but bouncing around. Uh, can't really say there's major trends. Uh, overall, they're slightly decreasing concentrations, but nothing that's definite. If we look at the flows, it's a little clearer. Again, slight decreases in the Alamo River. Uh, right now, flows are roughly 80% of what they were back in 1999. New River's only 67%. It has been a fairly steady decrease. And the White Rivers, White Water has been kind of all over the place, but it is lower now, slightly than it was back in 1999. Uh, to get to the loading, you just multiply the flows times the concentrations, and that tells you how much salt is coming in. Again, in 1999, here were the loadings uh, from, the, from the different, we also had 300,000 tons coming in from the ag drains. This was data provided by the Imperial Irrigation District. So we had about 3.8 million tons back then. Uh, right now, we are about 3 million, a little less. Uh, Again, you can see the, the differences. Alamo is still pretty high. New River is high, but decreasing. Moon is a result of the decreases in flows and whitewater more or less inconsequential. Uh, our totals right now are right about 2.7 million. If we, add the, if we assume that the uh, drains are still providing 300,000, about 3 million. So roughly a little less than 75% of the amount coming in that was coming in in 1999. So the amount of salt entering the sea has decreased, but there's still quite a bit of it. Um, Three million tons is a lot of salt. <laughs> and just a final note here, uh, salt in the water is not the only problem. Uh, the reason the Bureau of Reclamation was willing to fund work was that if you ever look at a map of ownership in the salt sea, uh, back when the railroads were put in, the railroads gave like every other section of land to the federal government or I think the state and the tribes, maybe it looks like a checkerboard. Well, the Bureau of Reclamation owns a lot of those checkerboards that are about to become dry land. And as you can see, uh, dust storms can be pretty significant. The top up at Salton City, uh, bottom, these pictures were taken just a few minutes apart down at Garst Road at the south end where the 
winds came up and really pick up the dust. Uh, this is where the big, really big concerns are in terms of health. As Imperial, Imperial County is one of the worst areas in the state of California in terms of air pollution from small particulates. And again, I mentioned, got some things referenced here. Uh, these are, if you want to see more, you can try to find these references. A couple of them are available. A lot of them are just personal communications or not, but I did want to give you some information if you wanted to look farther. And that's about what I've got. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions uh, as the presentations are being given, just use the Q&A button at the bottom and uh, we can get typed answers uh, live or typed answers uh, in real time from the panelists. Um, and then we'll also have a Q&A uh, period at the end of, the, of all the presentations. Uh, and again, this webinar is being recorded and we'll post it to the Pacific Institute website again. Um, so heard quite a bit about uh, salt and sea salinity but I think it's very instructive to look north to the Great Salt Lake, another terminal lake, uh, and the experiences there and uh, much greater salinities up there. And uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Elliot speak about the Great Salt Lake. Elliot? So I'm gonna talk about some of the composition and salinities of uh, Great Salt Lake and uh, some of the management issues that are part of that, mainly with the uh, impact that the causeway has caused between the two arms of, of the lake and some you know, interesting mineral precipitates that get recycled back into the lake. Okay. So as you know, uh, Great Salt Lake is a remnant of Lake Bonneville. Um, the desiccation of Lake Bonneville uh, res resulted in Great Salt Lake. Um, Great Salt Lake, its average elevation is 4,192 feet. Uh, currently today it's at 4,190, uh, give or take a couple feet due to drought in um, low inflow waters, okay? Uh, the ecosystem is heavily uh, reliant on the lake elevation. So we have microbialites, which you can see exposed in the, in the foreground of the photo. Um, most of those reefs uh, are exposed now. Um, they're important keystone species uh, to brine shrimp, which is a multi-million dollar um, business for the economy of Utah, uh, as well as brine flies, uh, migratory waterfowl that come up from Argentina and other places, uh, and of course, extremophiles, you know, the microbes that live in the, in the brine. Um, optimal ecosystem salinity is 12 to 15 percent. Its upper limit is 17 for these uh, species. Uh, but recently, you know, the, the salinity rose to 18 percent this past year, and in these back uh, lagoons of these microbialites uh, got up to 20 percent. Um, so high exposure of the microbialites, which is bad because the brine flies and the brine shrimp will lay their larvae on them. And uh, with the high salinity, it's also caused the brine flies to be complicated and um, uh, discombobulated, I guess. Uh, next. So the causeway, which you can see on the map, uh, that's Union Pacific Causeway that was built in 1959, uh, really separated the lake into two arms, um, the north arm, uh, which is Gunnison Bay, and the south arm, which is uh, Gilbert Bay. Uh, so the salinity in the north is mainly around 28% salinity, um, and currently it's at 4189, so it's about a foot lower than uh, the south arm, uh, whereas the south arm is on the verge of 17 to 18 percent. Uh, so if you click one more, South Arm also has a reoccurrence of this deep brine layer, which is 18 percent in salinity, and sometimes that deep brine layer will diffuse uh, during mixing events, uh, causing perhaps a rise in the salinity. So uh, one other takeaway, you know, ocean water is 3.5 percent, so higher, uh, high magnitude of uh, salinity compared to the ocean. But the chemistry is about the same, it's just more concentrated. Okay. Uh, this is just showing how salinity varies with elevation. Um, the different uh, points represent different sites, um, but basically the takeaway is that elevation 
does uh, really control the, the salinity. Okay. So why is it salty? Why is Great Salt Lake salty? You know, it's uh, desiccation from Lake Bonneville and all the uh, dissolved salutes uh, during those glacial periods that contributed to the basin. Um, also to the south, there's Jurassic gypsiferous shale um, that was exposed, which also was probably uh, drained into the basin. And there's also a possibility of hydrothermal brines that are emanating uh, some salutes into the system uh, at various times. But the current factors are the recycling of salutes on exposed lake beds, uh, where you have um, epifluorescent crusts or uh, spring holes that precipitate salts, and sometimes those will get washed back into the system. Um, diffusion of the deep brine layer, saline ground, groundwater evaporation, lake elevation. Uh, runoff is really important. Uh, if we don't get a good snow season, which we actually do uh, this year, so it will be interesting to see how it will raise the lake level, um, but also the river input. A lot of the rivers, uh, the, the water up in the mountains gets captured by reservoirs, and depending on how much flow they want those reservoirs to let out to get to the rivers, that really impacts it, as well as agriculture. Um, and then I'll talk about the causeway breach. And we also have these uh, compass uh, minerals and magnesium uh, uh, salt uh, um, industry uh, partners. So next. This is a complicated slide uh, that I drafted up just recently, but what you can see is the um, uh, evaporation ponds in the orange and all the other arrows indicate different sources of salute. The greens are springs and groundwater that flow into the system. Uh, the orange arrows coming off of the evaporation ponds, there's seepage ones, there's intake ones. So there's ins and outs of, of the salutes. And most of these companies are producing potash or magnesium from the lake. Uh, Compass in the north uh, is, is producing uh, salts from the north arm and magnesium, US mag in the south is, is producing from the south arm. Okay. So in the north arm, there's a salt crust. Uh, in 2015, uh, there is about three feet of this salt crust on the shore that could be um, mapped. Um, there's about 456 million short tons, but that is all based off of historic core data that was taken mainly in the 1970s. Uh, when oil uh, exploration was going on near Spiral Jetty. So it's not a definitive number, but um, we really don't know what the salt thickness is in the north. Okay. Uh, during the winter in the north arm, we precipitate a mineral called marabolite. It's sodium sulfate, 10 waters attached. It's very hydrous, as you can see that person walking through it. It's like walking through a slushy. Um, it precipitates all across the whole north arm uh, water body. Uh, if you use freak pits, uh, you can see mineral saturation on, on the, the left of this graph. Halite is saturated with this north arm brine. And as you lower the temperature, you can see marabolite starts to precipitate at, at number one. Anything below one is undersaturated. But as you cool that brine even more, you see that the red line of halite drops off. So then we're starting to dissolve the halite. So we have this uh, back and forth uh, uh, precipitation dissolution effect with a cold temperature. We also form marabolite on the lake margins that you can see in the bottom right. And that happens during the uh, winter um, from these spring seeps. And then that dries out during the summer because it's a very uh, temperature dependent uh, mineral, mineral for stability and it becomes a, a white powder. And then if we have surface runoff or a seiche, it will drain all that precipitate back into the lake. I would also add that because of the exposed lake bed now, a lot of these springs are um, being exposed that are uh, bringing more uh, salinity into the mud flats around the lake. Next. So this is a couple examples of these spring seeps. There's um, sediment collapse structures that just emanate to the surface. There's always these perennial marginal uh, saline springs. Um, there's this big spring hole in, 
uh, the bottom left, uh, letter C. This was a, a spring that was covered uh, by the lake in 2011. Um, and nobody knew about it, but it has an 8% salinity. And when it uh, drains um, 100 gallons per minute, it swaths across the whole mudflat and then precipitates halite. And again, when we have surface runoff or sage, all of that will get drained back into the lake. So you're recycling a lot of salutes. Uh, the upper graph just basically shows a transect of um, wells that uh, we sampled and basically shows the evolution, uh, isotopic evolution that uh, the marginal springs evolve into a Great Salt Lake brine. And the bottom is just showing uh, what minerals precipitate with evaporation. Again, there is no dolomite. That's just what the program wants to give you. Okay, so this is an example of subaqueous springs. Uh, we have a, a GoPro that we would, uh, when we could get a, go, a boat up to the north arm, we could throw a GoPro down and actually image the salt crust. And what you see in these images are dissolution holes. Um, that means some groundwater is, is coming up to the substrate of the lake in dissolving some of the salt. And then if you hit the next button, we have so many faults that have been mapped and not mapped. And where these holes occur are right where one of these uh, quaternary faults are. Okay, next. So groundwater contribution originally was uh, estimated to be 3%, but with recent modeling um, of the of surrounding of the, of the lake, uh, we have now figured it's 11 to 12%. So that's much higher and will definitely change your salute load uh, calculations of what enters the lake. Basically, the, the, gra the table showing residence time for um, the ions, calcium and bicarbonate is very short lived that uh, falls out very early with uh, precipitation of carbonate and, and gypsum on the mud flats and sulfate can be recycled into the system uh, highly variably with uh, mirabilite uh, precipitating in the lake on the shore and then uh, also gypsum on the mud flat. Okay, next. Okay, uh, don't worry about the ternary. Basically, it's just separating everything out into different um, uh, ions in, in showing that the major groundwater brines that you can see on the map, there's uh, several um, locations where uh, springs were sampled. And it's basically, basically showing uh, calcium chloride, chloride sulfate, sodium bicarbonate sulfate are the major brines surrounding Great Salt Lake. Um, that's supposed to be calcium chloride on the next tab, but uh, it's a typo, but uh, calcium chloride uh, could be attributed to some hydrothermal sources. Um, mixing of these brines in various ways can form a GSL brine, uh, lake brine. And then again, fault controlled groundwater beneath the lake is, is totally unknown in what that composition is. Okay, next. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears to uh, what the causeway has done. So the causeway was built in 1959. Um, it used to be a trestle causeway in the early 1900s, and they did a rock-filled uh, causeway. And they put these two culverts in during that time to allow uh, lake exchange from the south to the north. So the idea was salt load in the south would uh, sequester in, in the north, and that's why you would uh, precipitate all this halite. And as you can see, it's about 25,000 tons per year um, south to north. 15,000 uh, backflow from north to south. And then recently, uh, a new bridge was created in 2016. It's 180 feet wide. We used to be able to get a boat through there, um, but it no longer can because they had to raise the berm um, to not allow north to south flow due to higher salinity in the south. And, and one other thing, there's limited flow through the, the causeway itself, but they opened this bridge so that more flow could go from south to north to lower salinity in the south. Okay, next. But when they did that, they dissolved all the salt in the north. So here's pre-bridge up in the 2015, 
all the salt that was precipitating up there. And then 2018 through 2020, there was no salt on the shore. Where did it go? It back flushed back into the, into the south. So it was not really, uh, in hindsight, a really good idea. Next. So these are just uh, underwater images. Uh, 2019, hardly any salt that you could see in the subsurface or uh, in the, in the uh, bottom of the lake. And then uh, it took three years for salt to actually come back um, at the bottom of the lake. And this is a result of salt precipitating on top of the surface, falling down to the bottom of the lake, and then uh, allowing nucleation for bottom precipitation. Okay, next. Okay. We applied a method that the Dead Sea folks uh, have been doing for the last decade, where they take a vial of a brine that they take from the Dead Sea and they take a, a vial that has 10 grams of uh, sodium chloride. And basically what the difference is between those two in density measurements will tell you if you're saturated or undersaturated with uh, respect to halite. So on the right, you can see density. On top, you see the years for Great Salt Lake. This is the north arm. And you can see right when the causeway bridge opened, the density got really low. The density is inverse on the, on the y-axis. And you can see that the um, before the causeway, the lake level of, of the north arm was super low and you had high, high density. You were precipitating a bunch of salt. And then after that, it waxed and waned until to, you know, 2020, 20, 21, um, salt started to come back. But the differences in, in the ups and downs are seasonality due to the Mirabilite precipitation lowering the density. And so that's showing a seasonal effect of, of density changes. Next. And then this is the ending slide. This is showing the south arm salinity um, through time. You can see the, uh, the green uh, line is lake elevation bouncing around. Right when the causeway bridge was open, there was a lag effect. And then all of a sudden, there is a deep brine layer that showed up around 2018, 2020. And that was because of the back flush of, of the north arm brine, most likely. And then due to a historic low uh, this last year, uh, the salinity has just gone up to around 183 uh, grams per liter. And so that's just really showing that uh, when we open that bridge up, we flushed a bunch of salt. There is a lag effect, just like what we saw in the north. There is a lag effect for the salt to precipitate um, because it was uh, all in the south arm. But it took time for the south to bring in all the salt to the north. Um, so yeah, it, most of the salt mass is, uh, you know, moving back and forth between this bridge, but recently they uh, closed off the north flow to decrease salinity in the south. And with this high um, snowfall that we have this year, hopefully uh, that dam that they put in will increase inflow to the south and, and dilute the, the salinity. Next. And basically, these are all just takeaway points that I talked about. Um, salute recycling is highly dynamic in the north arm and south arm. It's surface flow and also in the lake itself uh, due to the other factors of low lake elevation and evaporation. Groundwater discharge is probably more significant than we ever thought. Um, and its composition provides uh, clues to the evolution of the Great Salt Lake brine. And then the salt crust story, um, I'm, I don't have to get into all that. So that's it. Well, thanks very much. Um, I think a lot of interesting takeaways and uh, learnings we can apply to uh, the salt sea there is. Um, I know so it's, what, a what, it's a totally different system, but you know, it's. Well, it's, there's there are a lot of similarities. And now there's, there's talk of a, uh, at least for long-term planning for the salt and Siva, some kind of causeway to separate the south and the north. So I'm curious, just one quick question um, before we move on to Tom is, uh, so you said they're raising the berm, is this a, a temporary measure or is this a long-term? The idea is a, a temporary measure during different seasons. Um, 
during a high inflow season, raise the berm. During low inflow season, get rid of the berm so any salute salt mass in the south can move to the north and get sequestered. So that's kind of our management decision at the point uh, of, at this time. Um, yeah, so we'll see how it's all a human experience. Yeah. Um, well, I, that's, I, having been up to the Great Salt Lake a few times, it's, it's an interesting system, but uh, benefit for Utah is that uh, your capital is downwind, so it gets a lot more attention. Than the yeah, state. it's a 1.5 or $1.8 billion uh, economic Im importance, and it's also, uh, you know, you've heard in the news about the, the dust storm, that, the dust storms that can be caused because of the lake uh, beds are exposed. Um, how they want to pump water into Great Salt Lake and pipeline from the Pacific that's bogus, that, that won't ever work. Um, I don't know, they're trying all these other uh, mitigations that are complicated and costly. Um, well, very much appreciate your taking some time and uh, talking about a Great Salt Lake and, and helping us understand better the solvency. So again, uh, people can post q and I think there's some questions there. Uh, and let me hand it over to Tom. Okay, I'm uh, sharing, and uh, let's start this. Um, <clears throat> are you uh, seeing the uh, slides? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> salt chemistry, particularly at high concentrations, and also desalination at the salt and sea, which actually tied together because that's how we look at the high concentrations uh, within our desalination system. Um, so one of the big questions that we're faced with now is how are we going to know what a hypersaline future is going to look like at the Salton Sea? This is uh, the future that we are looking at uh, is increasing salinity. Uh, it's been rising very quickly for the last few years since uh, mitigation flows were stopped uh, in 2018 and it is has been rising uh, since the um, the last most recent filling of the Salton Sea in 1905, uh, noting that the this area has been inundated with water many times over thousands of years. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, sort of a microcosm look at uh, at that. This is one of the channels at Desert Shores, which was cut off from the Salton Sea uh, several years ago, and uh, some of those channels are reaching a point that you're getting salt crusts, uh, both forming on the shoreline and even floating on the surface of the water. And uh, so it's it's an opportunity to maybe look at uh, what the future looks like. This is also Desert Shores channels. And you see the Salton Sea in the background. On the right, you see the former boat channel that used to connect to the Salton Sea that was cut off. And you see uh, some of the water in the channels and you note that there's um, quite a color difference between the water and that represents a uh, difference between salinity between different parts of the channels. So on the right, you see uh, a hypersaline area and the, uh, the red is uh, at that time mostly caused by uh, helophytic or salt loving uh, algae, uh, Denalela salina which uh, tends to grow in uh, salt evaporation ponds. Uh, Michael showed a few of those in some of uh, Cargill's ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area. And you'll note that this looks very similar for exactly the same reason. What's growing in that super salty water, uh, that area on the left with the birds in it is um, less salty. And uh, these, this um, situation at Desert Shores uh, changes quite dramatically because occasionally we get uh, rain downfalls. In the middle, you see a channel that was cut from one of the road from water rainwater falling on one of the roads and flowing down into, in this case, the left side and uh, filling it with water and reducing the salinity. Uh, but you can go go back uh, a couple of months later and you can see the situation reversing. Um, right now, what's on the right in this picture is actually the lower salinity body because there's also uh, a channel uh, that comes through what's called the shoreline ditch that um, brings water down from the mountains during a heavy flow into what's on the right side, which is the southmost uh, uh, part of the Desert Shores Channel. So one way to 
think about what the Salton Sea might look like in the future is to look at what's happening in these microcosms of a drying Salton Sea, like those we have at Desert Shores. And uh, there are similar channels uh, at Salton City. Uh, so we, it, it's perhaps instructive to look at, at what's happening in those uh, examples of what happens when Salton Sea water no longer has much inflow, just occasional rain, and uh, an example of uh, what we might see in the greater Salton Sea if uh, we get to a point of extreme salinity, which is actually uh, fairly likely. Um, another way to look at this is modeling of hydrology and salt balance. Um, Chris Holdren showed us uh, some modeling uh, that, that he had done uh, some years back, and uh, there are various ways to model. Uh, he was using uh, geochemistry models that are well-established models of what happens if you have certain salts uh, mixed together at certain temperatures and certain conditions. And uh, it, it's a fairly well-established science of, of modeling. Uh, and we also, this, what you're seeing here is just one of my attempts at uh, modeling using Bureau of Reclamation data. And I thank uh, the Bureau of Reclamation for coming up with things like the Salton Sea accounting model, which is a uh, fundamental to everything we do. Um, another way to look at it that we just heard is very interesting. Look at another drying salt lake, similar to the Salton Sea, although each is different. We have the example of the, the Aral Sea and in the uh, Middle Eastern area, which is, uh, you know, a, a was a huge lake, but uh, uh, irrigation flows were uh, re-channeled and cut off, and it's a, now a massive, mostly dried lake. And then we have the slightly closer and very interesting example of the Great Salt Lake uh, that we got a good view of in the last presentation. And as uh, Michael pointed out, uh, one of the most in fact, the most highly rated uh, plan or proposal for uh, Salton Sea um, long range uh, management, really, I'm not really going to call it restoration because it's not quite that, but management is, is a causeway across the middle of, of the Salton Sea and letting the um, letting the uh, salts from the south end where most of the river flows come in get uh, moved to the north end to essentially get extremely hypersaline and precipitate out just like you saw on the north end of the Great Salt Lake. And I think the lesson that we learned from the last presentation is you have to think very carefully about how you're gonna manage that situation uh, of moving salts from one side of a causeway to another, um, because if you make a mistake, un uh, unplanned for things can happen. So I think it's a very instructive to look at what happened at, um, at the Great Salt Lake and think how that applies to potentially putting a causeway across the middle of the sea and uh, to, to manage that carefully. And then uh, a fourth way to look at what happens when salt and sea salts get to high concentrations and what the evolution of that is likely to be as far as the chemistry of the salts in the salt and sea is uh, what we've been doing, which is to take salt and sea water into a desalination system. Uh, it is not the usual reverse osmosis desalination system. It's a thermal system, uh, uh, basically distillation. And uh, we're able using our uh, evaporator configuration, which is a vertical tube evaporator to um, bring the salt and sea uh, salts to very high concentration all the way up to um, where it gets saturated and, and salts just come right out of solution as solid. Uh, so we can use this uh, to take a look at what's happened and what will happen to the Salton Sea over the next decade or more. We can look at that in the space of uh, a day. Uh, so that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So this is one example of uh, eight hours of Salton Sea water in brine, concentration. Uh, this uh, run was, I think, done in uh, uh, to 2010. So the Salton Sea was uh, at a lower starting salinity, but we also use a, um, a gypsum slurry in order to not have salts uh, precipitating out on the equipment, particularly gypsum. So that, that raised um, the uh, total dissolved solids a little higher than what the incoming uh, Salton Sea water was. I'll show you more about that later. But Basically, um, we're 
we're looking at uh, uh, total dissolved solids and also suspended solids, uh, of which uh, the suspended solids is down at the bottom. There's not very much. It's really just showing our, our slurry, uh, which is protective of the equipment uh, down at the bottom lines. The, the lines rising in the middle are just a couple of different ways of looking at total dissolved solids through this eight hour brine concentration. Um, starting at, a, at about uh, 70 grams per liter, which is roughly where the salt and sea is now on total dissolved solids and taking it up to about 350 grams per liter, which is just below the, the saturation point where sodium chloride would come out as, as halide. Uh, solid. So um, there are a couple different ways of measuring this. The uh, Chris mentioned gravimetric analysis and also um, adding up the ions. So the analytical lab figures, which are in the um, the um, uh, kind of uh, for TDS, it's the light blue. Uh, those are analytical lab, which is made by adding up the ions that they measure when we send a sample in and get them to put it through a mass spectrometer and, and give us the readback of all ions. Um, and then the other way is the gravimetric method where you basically just take a volume, uh, a carefully measured volume of salt and sea water uh, or the brine that's concentrating in this and you dry it down in, a, in an oven until it gets to full dryness and then you uh, uh, weigh that. And so uh, you can see the uh, the gravimetric with the dark blue line is uh, reads a little bit higher than the uh, analytical lab add up of ions, but they're not vastly far apart, and they do follow the the trend line fairly well. So uh, the, I think the note from this is that you can concentrate salt and sea water all the way up to 350 grams per per liter before you get to uh, precipitation of sodium chloride. So uh, because it's a mix rather than just sodium chloride, sodium chloride would, if it was pure, it would precipitate out somewhere a little above, um, to, to uh, somewhere above, a little above 25% salt, but we're going much higher than that in the mix of salt and seawater. Um, this is the actual um, ion, major ions uh, in the water in that same eight hour brine concentration run. I'll note this was done at 52 degrees C. So it's a little hotter than a really hot July afternoon in the Imperial Valley. Um, and you can do that uh, because we're running under vacuum, you can get evaporation at relatively moderate temperatures. Um, and what you see from this is uh, sodium and, and chloride, which is the dark blue and the purplish line. The chloride is just rising pretty steadily uh, as you concentrate. The uh, sodium does rise, but there's a bit of a, a notch there, and um, you have to, uh, uh, you know, think about what might be coming out of solution at that point to get get to that notch. Uh, then, when you look at um, and magnesium, likewise, which is the dark red, is rising steadily. Then at, down at the bottom, you see the sulfate, uh, which is in yellow. And you see that start to rise uh, as we do the first couple hours of concentration. But then as we get up to a certain point, then you see it drop and, uh, and then continuously go down. And what uh, is happening there is uh, precipitation of the sulfate as gypsum. Uh, that's, that's the primary uh, thing going on. So uh, we uh, do definitely see that, and it's why we have a gypsum slurry in the solution so that that sticks to the particles of the slurry and not to the uh, lining, uh, the metal walls of the equipment. But uh, we definitely see that precipitation of, of gypsum going on in a drop in sulfate. The amount of calcium is substantially lower, so it's not as obvious um, because the calcium line is um, really just kind of down at the bottom of, of the graph uh, in, in purple and hard to see. But uh, here's a, another that uh, shows a, a similar thing. Uh, this was uh, a different run uh, at, uh, a year or so later. And here we're, uh, it, instead of just going at a single temperature uh, all the way through, we're actually uh, modeling what our um, desalination system would uh, look like. And I don't mean computer modeling, I mean real world modeling, we're running it. And we're picking uh, 
grind concentrations and operating temperatures and operating pressures that we would use in a big commercial system, uh, but we're running at a, at a pilot scale on a fairly small piece of equipment. And uh, so um, this, this shows uh, five different points uh, across uh, what we, and I'll explain this later, what would be a 15 effect um, desalination operation. And, but what we're seeing is a uh, brine concentration over uh, a range of temperatures. And, uh, and, and we're seeing chloride in that sort of yellowish, uh, or yellowish green at the top, just steadily rising. We're, we're seeing um, sodium in the blue line uh, rising and then at a little bit slower rate. So uh, it, it seems that uh, some, some uh, uh, sodium is precipitating out that, that could be uh, uh, with um, potentially with the sulfate uh, that we see drop. And um, then at the, uh, at the bottom there that, that we can see um, one, the, the green line, uh, magnesium steadily rising as we concentrate. And then sulfate, the red line, uh, rises a little and then starts dropping out. And that again is showing the, uh, the gypsum coming out of solution. One difference in the way this shows it is it's, uh, we're showing number of particles, uh, molarity meaning uh, essentially the number of particles. Uh, so it's particles of each um, sodium or chloride or sulfate uh, over the total number of particles in the solution, uh, which is a little bit more useful than just looking at um, the weight of material because different ions have different weights. Uh, now uh, we'll show the same thing, uh, just taking the sodium and, and chloride out of the picture so that we can look more carefully at, this, at the uh, lesser con concentrated ions. Here you see again the green with the magnesium rising very steadily. Uh, and uh, very clearly you see um, the uh, red line of sulfate rising a bit and then dropping out as we get uh, precipitation, uh, mostly of, of gypsum. Uh, and then you also down at the bottom, uh, you know, you see, you, you can see the, uh, you can see potassium uh, rising, uh, but you can see the calcium. Uh, actually rising a little bit and then dropping out as we get uh, calcium sulfate uh, with two uh, water molecules is gypsum. And we're seeing now in the, uh, at this sort of expanded view, we're seeing the calcium dropping out of solution along with the sulfate. Um, the challenge of that is uh, that reaction is, uh, is uh, calcium limited. So you have one molecule of sulfate, one molecule of, of calcium. Uh, forming a precipitate, but there's a lot less calcium in the water than there is um, the sulfate molecules. So the, the reaction there is limited by the amount of calcium that's available in the water. And that calcium is used in some biological processes. So as Chris showed, a fair bit of calcium coming in through the river, it does get used up in things like uh, barnacle shells and other stuff. Um, I'm going to switch gears for a moment and, and talk about the desalination tech that we use to get these data. Um, uh, the more popular technology, reverse osmosis, uh, works fine on, on everything from uh, brackish groundwater to uh, ocean water and a little bit above that. Um, but when you get to a really hypersaline water source like the Salton Sea, uh, the uh, the energy efficiency of reverse osmosis really drops. You need a lot of energy and a lot of to run pumps to drive a lot of pressure uh, because as you get to highly saline water, uh, the highly saline water uh, inherently has a high osmotic pressure. You need the pumps to reverse the osmosis to run at an even higher pressure than the osmotic pressure inherent in the brine. And so um, you get to need very high pressures. And if you get as high as 130 grams per liter of, of uh, solids in your, uh, of dissolved solids in your source water, you get to a point where the, the, the best available current uh, RA technology really doesn't even work because it's the, the, the membrane cartridges will actually collapse because the pressures are so high uh, if you get up to super saline water. And if you model the salt and sea going forward, even with current inflows, eventually a little over 10 uh, to 15 years from now, we're gonna start getting close to that 130 grams per liter limit where the RO doesn't even work at all. Therefore, we use thermal desalination, which is 
much more efficient than RO when you get to really high total dissolved solids um, and still works all the way up into sodium chloride saturation. That's why we do it. So the technology we're using is multi-effect uh, distillation, which is the most energy efficient thermal desalination technology in current use. Uh, there are a number of plants that use it in the Middle East mostly and several other places in the world. Uh, not much in the United States, um, but, uh, but it, 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 it does exist and it is used in some brine concentration uh, applications in industry. And then a vertical tube evaporator is the way we do that multi-effect. Um, there, there are horizontal tube evaporators in commercial use. Uh, we use a vertical tube evaporator because it is very good at going to high concentrations, which is what we're dealing with at the Salton Sea. Uh, it, it, it performs better at super high concentrations to use the vertical tube technology. It's been around a long time. It's established in food, chemical processing, and it's extensively used for industrial brine concentration. So we marry those two technologies, vertical tube evaporators with uh, multi-effect distillation. Um, and that's not unknown. It, it's, it's done in the industry. Uh, the uniqueness is we're doing at the Salton Sea with renewable energy, with um, that particular challenges of salt and sea water and some things that were invented by my dad to uh, make that work a little better in high brine concentrations. Um, but it's a well-suited uh, technology for this high salinity source water and for an environment where you really cannot dump brine in the ocean. It's an inland environment. One of the big problems with the salt and sea's ecological impact is high salinity. So we can't be dumping any brine in the sea. We, we have to turn it to solids or deal with it in a very effective way, co-injection with uh, geothermal or turn it into valuable products and sell it. Um, this is way the uh, the uh, vertical tube evaporator works inside. It's uh, this cutaway view that shows that you essentially have seawater running in tubes. Uh, uh, this is a downflow configuration. We've also worked with upflow that has different characteristics, uh, but does work well. And uh, we, we take the salt and sea water in at the top. There's a distribution uh, orifice plate that then separates that water to run between the tubes. It flows down as a, as a layer on the inside of, of some evaporator tubes. The, the, the center of the tube is a vacuum. The, the side of the tube has the water flowing down as a layer. We um, heat those tubes and the, the seawater will then evaporate and the vapor will fill the middle of the tubes that drops out the, the bottom into a, a circulated brine pool. The vapor comes out the, the side of that as, as the cascade comes down and gets pulled off to a condenser. Uh, the brine is recirculated so you can keep going to higher and higher concentrations. The way we do the heat is hot steam coming in from the right, as you show, which then condenses on the outside of the evaporator tubes and transfers its heat of condensation into the water flowing as a layer on the inside of the tubes. Pretty simple system. Uh, there are some complications to making it work well and reliably, but it's the basics of it are simple. It's distillation, which we've been known for couple of thousand years. Uh, this is the actual um, em uh, embodiment of it, which is uh, currently at one of the uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy Renewables geothermal plants at the southeast end of the Salton Sea and um, set, up, set up there for future testing. This is our energy source. As you've maybe heard, uh, the thermal uh, energy, thermal desalination technologies are considered to be energy expensive. Um, so we need uh, an energy source, a heat source, that is to begin with low cost. And because I'm a personal believer in uh, the way in in having having a future that is livable for the world and reducing the impact of climate change, I believe renewables are the way to go. And in the Imperial Valley, they definitely are. And we have a beautiful resource of uh, renewable energy. And what you're seeing in the picture is uh, actually steam that is released from the geothermal brine immediately before it gets pumped back down underground. 
they do a little um, atmospheric pressure blow off of steam. The pressure is not high enough at this point in the process to spin a turbine. They've already extracted the, uh, the energy from the high pressure steam to spin turbines at three different levels. And this is what they call their, their uh, atmospheric flash steam, uh, which lets off some steam. And if you come by the south end of the Salton Sea, you see that steam going up in the air 24 uh, seven. So our target is to capture that essentially vented wasted steam and use that um, essentially waste energy renewable resource as uh, a, the driver for our process. Um, and so that's the, the data show are, are all from uh, uh, heating with uh, renewable um, uh, vented uh, type of uh, geothermal steam. It's, this process is designed around that. The way you get better energy efficiency uh, out of um, a distillation process is multi-effect distillation. So we bring in our, our um, geothermal steam at uh, atmospheric pressure, um, boiling temperature, which is 212 Fahrenheit uh, at, at atmospheric pressure. We bring that into our first effect evaporator on the outside that then heats up the evaporator tubes. We have salt and sea water uh, circulating on the inside of those tubes, which is then heated up and vaporized. And the vapor from that process then becomes the steam source for the next step. So we drop down uh, by um, uh, about five degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and we do it a second time. We take the heat from the, from the first distillation and we reuse that vapor as a, as a heat source for a second pass. And we uh, continue with the same as, uh, process of uh, seawater uh, circulating inside and being heated by steam coming from the prior effect that then vaporizes and we use it yet again, drop the temperature about five degrees Fahrenheit or uh, two and a half degrees centigrade and um, evaporate again. We can do that again and again and again from the starting uh, heat of the, uh, of the flashed um, uh, geothermal steam down to the uh, cooling temperature. And at the Salton Sea, uh, the cooling water is around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's true of both the uh, cooling system at the uh, BHA renewables uh, plants. Also happens to be about equal to the summer surface temperature of the Salton Sea. So whether we were using incoming seawater as our cooling source that we would then later evaporate, or whether we're using the uh, cooling tower loop at the uh, uh, geothermal plant, it's about the same temperature um, in the winter. It's a, it's a lot cooler, but our worst case is summer afternoons, which is about 95 Fahrenheit. So in that summer afternoon situation, you can do this en energy recovery step about 15 to 16 times over. Um, so for every pound of steam we get from the geothermal plant, we can, we can get uh, 14 pounds of purified distilled salt and seawater. Uh, so that's how we get uh, reasonable energy efficiency. And the current efforts are actually to go further than that and get more effects uh, starting with hotter geothermal steam and, uh, and even more energy efficiency. Um, this is what a, a plant like that might look like um, if it was built at commercial scale on the on the you know somewhere near the Salton Sea. Uh, we can certainly put that inside a building and paint it a beautiful color. But if you just build it out in the open, that's what it looks like with 15 evaporator effects and a condenser uh, based on the uh, geothermal um, steam source that's uh, waste energy essentially. Um, this is performance data that we collected. Uh, from our, our testing. And um, so you can, the process here delivers about uh, 3,400 pounds per hour of distilled water from uh, about 248 pounds per hour of non-commercial geothermal steam. Uh, if you take um, one of the um, mid-sized geothermal plants that's releasing steam into the air, you can get about 120,000 pounds per hour of steam out of that, which is sufficient to do about 4.8 million gallons per day of pure distilled water from the Salton Sea. How pure is that water is a reasonable question. And if I can get this to advance, there we go. Um, this shows it. We get about a 10,000 to one purification. So on the, on the left, um, you see 
Uh, the leftmost is what's in our, our slurry tank, and that's what's going into our system. Our feed tank is salt and seawater. So the, the, the second column is the chemistry of salt and seawater back in 2011. Um, and uh, which, what is a little bit interesting to note from this, which uh, uh, may apply to one of the questions, is if you look at the sulfate in the salt and seawater, it's um, 11,000 milligrams per liter or 11 grams per liter. And uh, in, the, uh, in the slurry tank, it's 15 grams per liter because we took a, a slurry of uh, pure fine particle um, gypsum and, uh, and introduced that. And we see that we and and we most of that stays as solid particles, but we get a certain amount of um, redis redissolution of uh, gypsum from that slurry into the water into the salt and seawater, which is why we see a little bit higher sulfate in the salt and seawater after after it's gone through the slurry tank and then into our system compared to coming straight out of the salt and sea. So it shows a little bit of redissolution of gypsum, which we will see, as Michael was asking, if you, you know, dilute salt and seawater, is some of that gypsum on the bottom going to come into solution? Yeah, some will. Um, and then the four columns on the right are just four different samplings of the distilled water. And you can see that all of those um, salts that were in that salt and seawater are down at extremely low levels. Uh, we can see there's a little bit of sulfate, but it's way low. Uh, we can see there's a little bit of chloride, also very low. Um, most of the others are actually at uh, below the uh, detection limit of the uh, uh, mass spectrometry uh, that was uh, used to evaluate this at a commercial lab. So we're getting what you're seeing here is actually less salt than bottled water. Um, in fact, bottled water adds a little in for taste. And uh, if we were to do this and you actually wanted to use it in the potable water system, which we wouldn't, but if you did, you'd add a little salt back in so it tastes good and it doesn't leach salts out of, and, and ions out of the pipes. Um, but what we propose to do with this is not to use it for potable water, but to use it for habitat restoration. What this can do is provide a direct source of highly purified salt and sea water that can be blended with the substantially polluted New, New or Alamo River water and the, um, the salt, then the high salt that they're getting out of, out of the salt and seawater. Um, I've done some analysis that indicates that you may in the hot summertime with a lot of evaporation rate, get some selenium is issues where it could go above the, uh, the uh, EPA recommended limits. And by having this third super pure source of water, uh, you can keep the blend in the habitat ponds uh, at, a, at a really ideal level for exactly where you want to target it. Um, so that's the thought. And so, uh, um, yeah. we're, we're running out of time. Maybe we could. Okay, so I'm on time. my last two slides. So um, I won't get any detail of this, but this is uh, just what um, analysis uh, going forward at the salt and sea uh, might look like if you had long term reduction of Colorado River water. And if that happens, we could get all the way up to the point where halide would. Uh, come out a solution. Uh, also, if you did a causeway solution, the north end of this, uh, end of it would kind of look like this, and you would reach a point where halide is, uh, or so sodium chloride salts are coming out of solution. And then the final um, points from this. Um, one, um, I did a, a, a test, uh, gravimetric uh, TDS of salt and seawater at the Desert Shores location uh, on Monday, and the results on that as of this morning are 74.7 grams per liter, which is consistent with what we've been seeing. And, um, and that exceeds a level that's sustainable for fish. Consequently, we do see that the fishery is in collapse. Um, I used to see fish along the shore of the sea all the time. It's very hard to find any anymore. And uh, we're seeing that the fish eating birds like pelicans, uh, cormorants, and so forth, are, uh, and osprey, and et cetera, are not completely gone, but disappearing from the Salton Sea. And the birds that we still have are having to go to other water bodies in order to survive. Um, we know that Salton Sea, as Chris said, is saturated with respect to gypsum and, and, and calcite. 
Both of those reactions are calcium limited. So um, we, we will see and do see gypsum precipitating out and that will continue, but the amount that precipitates out is gonna be limited by the amount of calcium that's available in the salt and sea water. Uh, Mirabolite, which is a, a, a hydrated form of uh, sodium sulfate, uh, will reach saturation levels, but it's those saturation levels uh, apply to cold conditions. Uh, Mirabolite is very temperature sensitive as to when it comes out of solution. Uh, the Salton Sea area is much warmer most of the time than the Great Salt Lake, so I don't think we're going to see a lot of Mirabolite like you do at the Great Salt Lake, but on a cold winter day um, like what we've had, uh, the cold wind yesterday, it's it's not impossible that we might see some. Um, and then uh, overall, if we uh, don't uh, see any reductions in the Salton Sea in inflows, the Salton Sea is likely to reach a new equilibrium that's below halite solubility. Um, at, at what we've seen is a, uh, over 350 grams per liter uh, because of the mixed salts in the sea. Uh, however, inflow reductions are likely because of the demand uh, on, the, on the river exceeding supply, also climate change impacts, wastewater recycling that's likely to increase, and, and potential policy change as managing the river. Uh, so definitely an engineered brine sinks that we might get uh, with uh, future plans, and possibly in the residual salt and sea, we may reach that halite solubility limit, in which you, case you would see massive amounts of salt um, coming out of solution. And that's that's it for me. Uh, thank you all. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, and I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, I had some questions, but I think in the interest of time, I will hand it over to the audience. Um, there are a couple of questions on the q and I think for uh, Tom and uh, for you in particular, and maybe uh, Chris had another question up there as well. So if you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand. And I think, uh, Rob will unmute you. Um, and then uh, if I don't see any immediately, I'll, I'll pester the, uh, in fact, while people are doing that or raising their hands uh, and Rob's unmuting people, uh, maybe an initial question would be, um, as we see all the precipitation, the salts coming out of solution, um, and uh, Ali showed uh, what happens to the drain pipes in the Imperial Valley uh, with some of the salts and the need for maintenance. Uh, any speculation from many of the panelists on what high salt loads could do to some of the pumps and other things that are being considered, uh, in fact, being constructed at the Salt Sea uh, specifically for the species conservation habitat, but what kind of maintenance that might require, how quickly those might get fouled or, or completely blocked, and how we might see um, the impacts of, of that kind of salt precipitation on equipment. And I'll just show that to anyone while um, we're getting questions from the audience. Um, this is Misty. I've been asked to unmute. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I want to thank everybody because this is very enlightening. There was a lot of information here that I did not know. My question, though, to keep time short here, is for Tom. Um, I'm very interested in his multi-tube. I'm sorry if I'm not using the right words. I, I would like to know... He, he touched on how much it can do volume wise, but how many do we have and how fast can we make this happen? Because I'm very interested in the whole process and making sure that he, you know, he uses it for the environment with the mixing and all that. And I'm sorry if I don't know all the technical terms, but I, I just wanna know how fast and how much and you know, what do we need to do to make this happen? Thank you. If the agencies were involved, were willing to do it, uh, right now I'm kind of under attack by some of the agencies, um, but if they were willing to take it seriously, um, and it would take a, probably about six years to build up enough capacity to make a, a big difference. Uh, the capacity needed is large. It's um, a little over uh, 100 million uh, gallons per day. Um, uh, total. Uh, and I actually propose to, to do that with uh, uh, five 20 million gallon per day plants built out over several several years, uh, you know, plant by plant. 
uh, and uh, use, and taking advantage of some of the currently available steam resources um, from the geothermal industry. But it would, in order to have enough energy to do that, you would need to work with the local geothermal industry to um, to buy steam from them as they build out their plants, as they build out for lithium uh, in the coming years. If that all works, they will have some extra steam available. Uh, and you could buy that steam from them at a reasonable market price. And uh, it, it would be possible to build out uh, the 100 million gallons a day or more that it would take to um, gradually, and I do say gradually, gradually push down the salinity of the Salton Sea uh, back to a level where it can sustain fish and birds and ecosystem and recreational uses. Uh, do, uh, the actual play out of that would, would happen over a, a couple of decades. So it's not an instant solution, but uh, you could build enough capacity in, in six years or so um, to where you start moving the, the needle uh, on salinity down to a point uh, where the, uh, the fish could come back and the birds could come back and uh, the recreational uses uh, could uh, would, uh, come Would back. this method, last question, would this method be useful in other areas like the Great Salt Lake and um, along the Colorado River? It's uh, potentially useful at the Great Salt Lake. We can work with extremely high salinity uh, water like the Great Salt Lake has. It's well beyond what the Salton Sea has, but it's, it's possible to do. Um, and along the Colorado River, it, uh, the salinity of the Colorado River is much lower. It's about uh, 700 uh, milligrams uh, per liter or less than one gram per liter uh, salinity. So um, it's, it's probably not the technology choice that you would do to actually desalinate Colorado River water. Uh, it, it, uh, the uh, economics of it are very good at high salinity water. Thank you. you um, I'm just going to ask a quick follow up on that. Um, you mentioned that uh, disposal of brine would be a challenge. Do you? Uh, there was. Um, I did a quick calculation on uh, if there's three million tons of salt entering the Salton Sea. That's roughly a square mile, uh, a yard deep of yeah. salt every year. Right. So, so that's, that's a huge amount of salt. So we've um, we've addressed that in a couple of ways. Uh, one of the the first ways we looked at is to co-inject that with the geothermal brine. You've got millions of gallons per day of concentrated brine at, at full saturation actually going through these geothermal, geothermal plants. And they, they, they bring in this up from the geothermal reservoir. They flash them off at steam. Uh, they have to put down at least uh, 80%. And they typically put down closer to 90% of that brine back uh, uh, underground, but there's a certain deficit there, and you could fill that deficit with concentrated salt and sea brine. So we looked at that doing geothermal geochemical modeling initially and doing a series of pilot tests, and we did develop a process that uh, makes the salt and sea brine compatible with the geothermal brine. So that's one way to safely dispose of that salt locally and potentially even help sustain the geothermal aquifer as it's built out more than it is now. But the other thing we discovered in developing that process to make the salt and sea brine compatible with the geothermal uh, brine, and it was serendipitous, is that um, the, the product we got was actually um, pure, almost pure sodium chloride which uh, is uh, we can just dry it and market it and put it on rail cars and, and ship it out, of, out, out to other areas in the United States or even internationally on barges and, um, and move that salt out as a commercial product. Uh, obviously, right. if we did that too much too fast, we would drop the price of the market. So it's uh, something you would want to do gradually. Great, thank you. Uh, I see Charming's got a question. Yes, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for the great presentation. Uh, Tom, you should really speak with Sierra Club. Um, I'm with Sierra Club, just for let you know. My question, I had asked um, Ali some questions, and really what I was getting to is the fact that um, the Colorado is in short supply, and how would water recycling, whether it's DPR or tertiary treated water, how would that play into 
um, the salt and sea and what's happening currently. And you did touch a little bit on it. And for me, we're looking at the future when Ali's talking about leaching and using potable water. And even though some of the farmers are now using better irrigation, but, uh, you know, what else can we look at into the future? And uh, you mentioned water recycling and the fact that that may divert less water into the Salton Sea. But couldn't that water also be purchased for farmers to use on the fields? It's, it's possible to do that. Uh, the challenge is that farmers right now have a very low price for um, Colorado River water. And that's because they, because those farms have been in operation for over a hundred years, they have a, a right to put that water to beneficial use, which is producing food for all of us to eat and for, for uh, you know, horses and cows, et cetera, as well. And uh, so they, they get that water right now for $20 uh, per acre foot, which is incredibly low price. That is not the value of the water. That's really just the cost of distributing it from the, you know, we, we get the water essentially for free off the All-American Canal. That's the, you know, uh, water that's essentially owned by the citizens of the United States. And uh, because of the, the legal system of um, distribution of that water, the, farm, the farmers just pay the distribution price from the All-American Canal down to their actual farms, which is the really cheap uh, $20 an acre foot. Recycling water is happening and will happen more. The cost to recycle the water is much more than $20 per acre foot. So that's the trick is to find a way that um, recycled water um, can be used cost effectively compared to the incredibly cheap price of the Colorado River that the uh, farmers currently have a right to. Yeah, I and I get the price thing. I, I'm, I'm very familiar with that. But th the fact of the matter is that uh, the Colorado is not going to last, not uh, the way we abuse it. And so I'm just thinking of, you know, how much further out in the future should we be planning? And oh, we should be me. planning, yeah, decades. We should be planning yeah. decades out. Um, we, we've got we've got a problem on the Colorado River that was at least 20 years in the making, and probably longer in that than that, because when the original compacts were made, they were making assumptions of of Colorado River flows, which were actually at, even at the time <laughs> uh, known to be um, optimistic, shall we say. Uh, so it, it, the, the, the compacts that were made on who's, who's got a right to how much water on the Colorado River, Colorado River have been just out of balance for a very long time, and it's been physically out of balance now for 20 years, which is why the, the reservoirs are, are going down. Um, you know, it's not just a, a drought, it's, it's, it's a long-term issue. And um, I, I think either, I mean, we are seeing uh, uh, farmers using less water to grow the same amount of crops, and they have been quite effective at, at that, but you can only go so far with that. Uh, and I, th I think Ali, uh, you know, explained <laughs> the reasons for that. And uh, so I, I think we are going to have to look at alternative water supplies for the entire American Southwest, and that could be reclaiming uh, saline groundwater that's not currently in use, and it could be reclaiming uh, or, or, or using ocean water, whether you bring it in here where the renewable energy is and, and desalinate it here, or whether you do it out at the coast. And, um, you know, right now we're sending Colorado River water to the coast, <laughs> to a place that's got plenty of water in the Pacific Ocean if they would uh, be willing to pay the money to desalinate it and rather than the current policy, which is essentially put a straw in the desert, suck it dry and, um, and send that to the coastal cities. Thanks, Tom. Um, and if other members of the audience have questions, go ahead and raise your hand. I have a, maybe a follow-up question for Ollie. Uh, in the past four or five years, I think leaching uh, in the Imperial Valley increased considerably. Do you see any long-term uh, or even short-term benefits for Imperial Valley soils uh, for that additional slug of water? Uh, and um, maybe on the second part of that, speaking a little bit about what Tom was talking about, uh, about the 
long-term prospects for Colorado River water uh, diminishing and uh, Imperial Irrigation District's likely reductions in the future going forward. Do you see that as diminishing crop production or maybe it's just a little speculative or um, do you see Imperial Valley taking some uh, marginal lands out of production and focusing on lands that have uh, perhaps better quality soils, less needing additional leaching? The first Thanks. part of your question, uh, Michael, you mentioned uh, the leaching water increase over the, the last couple of years. Uh, so looking at some of Imperial IID's data, it looked like the amount of water that they were using for leaching, um, yeah, really over the past four or five years increased pretty significantly over uh, years prior. Um, not sure how that's going to continue given additional reductions, but if you've seen well, any impacts of that on the on the fields or if, if that was more localized, uh, just a couple fields. Well, I think, you know, the amount, the average amount, I, I don't really, because I'm working in the field, you know, my data is not from Imperial, it's from the real, uh, you know, growers, because you are measuring, you know, whatever. Uh, but, I, you know, I cannot say, you know, it can help for, for improvement in the future or that increase, they need to continue, you know, to increase uh, leaching. But, you know, what I meant, we need, you know, leaching to make sure we can maintain the soil productivity. The amount we think, you know, I think in, in most cases, half an acre, fifth per acre should work for most of the so, you know, we have and the crop uh, we have in the desert. For some sensitive crops, perhaps no, you know, we need more. If we use, for example, the drip irrigation, we accumulate salt and it comes from, you know, uh, drip irrigation. We can conserve water to drip irrigation, but also we need to apply more for leaching. You know, not every water conservation, it's really water conservation in some point. Uh, so the second part of your question in the future, I think our growers already started, you know, to, to do a better job with their efficiency. They even, you know, they use tailwater recovery system. We had a, a big grant from CDFA recently. They supported, you know, 10 growers to go with automated surface irrigation. It means if they go with automated surface irrigation, it means they will reduce the tailwater in their they're farmed in the future. They are efficient. It means less water goes from tail water to the saltancy. And of course, less salt and phosphor goes to saltancy. I think it's a paradox, you know, what is going on in the future with that, what the conservation practices, you know, is, is really unclear. I, we need, we, we see some improvement in terms of efficiency, you know, sending less water and also sending less uh, nutrient to salt and sea. I think that's that's very complicated, you know, to think about future. Uh, but if you have a specific question about water conservation, I can, uh, you know, talk more about that. Well, uh, thank you. I'm th sorry to throw you uh, or put you on the spot um, about how much uncertainty there is about future Colorado river flows and what that might mean for the amount of ground that's being irrigated. Uh, I mean, there's there's been, uh, I think, increasing conservation, which reduces tail water, but tile water uh, has remained relatively constant. And my understanding is that uh, the tile water contains not all the salts, but much of the salts, um, those concentrated salts through the, the tile lines that you were showing earlier. And I think some of our earlier projections were showing that um, we're gonna see that trend continuing moving forward as farmers become more efficient, but they can't eliminate the leaching because then they can. No, not at all. Even I mentioned, you know, if you go with drip irrigation, you can save water, but you also add some salt to the soil. Even your leaching, you know, is it's, it's, it's more uh, than, than flood irrigation. For leaching, if you, you just talk about leaching, not about water conservation. But we can conserve 2.2 acre feet per acre. And of course, we need to leach, use that, you know, that water, at least part of that for leaching. But still, we can conserve water, I think, with, with those uh, conservation practices. Thanks. Uh, and Elliot had, a, um, I think, a point about a wastewater treatment 
plant being built uh, or being considered up at the Great Salt Lake to uh, bring additional water to the Great Salt Lake? There have been some thoughts about that. It's uh, currently being built and they're almost to the wastewater treatment plant. So <clears throat> they're their idea was uh, to build this out across the Antelope uh, Causeway to, into the state park and where the drainage of Farmington Bay comes in. That's where it's going to discharge to help move that flow further into the into the lake. And uh, I guess a unrelated question for you is the amount of salt that's actually produced out of Great Salt Lake. Do you have uh, a ballpark estimate of how much water or sorry, how many salts? general oh, dollar value or tons that they're... Uh, no, my economic uh, geologist would know the true true numbers. <laughs> but there is an active industry. Yes. Solvent. Yes, U.S. Magnesium uh, produces out of the South Arm. Um, that's usually for magnesium metals, uh, but also for uh, road salt as well. But um, they're doing well right now, but because of the low lake level, they're having problems uh, bringing in that water to their into their ponds at the moment. Okay. Um, no, so, we're, good. Um, so we really are uh, well over time and I, I just want to give the panelists uh, an opportunity if they have any concluding thoughts um, and then we'll wrap it up. So maybe Elliot, since you're on screen now. Um, yeah, well, I went to a talk last year, this woman from uh, South America who's studying the Salars out there. She's discovered a, a strand of halo Bilica bacteria, and she's marketing it now for um, uh, desalinizing soils. And I was wondering if uh, perhaps, uh, Alia, have you heard of that or know anything about halophilic microbes helping bleach the soil and desalinize it? No, the research yet. There are some thought, but we don't have any research on that. Okay, I, I know she's starting a, a startup in California, um, and some of her uh, results from these preliminary tests show really good uh, recovery um, of plants, mostly. I don't know about the soil, but the plants. I, I'm intrigued by that, so if you were to, I'll, I'll follow up with you. And, and, yeah, and I'll, 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 I to remember her name, I can't remember. Um, the other question I had, um, near the salt, is there a wastewater treatment plant and, and would that be considered for um, putting effluent into the salt or at least using it for irrigation? Uh, so currently the, the cities around the salt sea discharge, particularly in the Imperial Valley, uh, into, the, into the New and Alamo rivers and treated wastewater, not raw, just, not raw sewage. So that effluent does go into the salt sea. And then there's some uh, less treated or even raw sewage that crosses the border from Mexico that also contributes to the quantity. All gotcha. that degrades quality from the sea. Okay, cool. Um, Ali, any concluding remarks? Not really, but you know, one, one uh, another idea is currently in, in the valley is to use groundwater, you know, and, and do something on, on it. Uh, but a serious talk, you know, we don't even know how salty is that water. We know it's very salty, but there is no study over the last at least 20, 30 years, you know. Can be feasible, you know, to use groundwater to do something on it and uh, at least use it for leaching or some, some purposes? This is another idea, you know, another source of water. And I, I think Lawrence Livermore did a study 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, that's really yeah, long, yeah. But since then, really yeah. Not, not new, not recently, yes. And, and actually, in our, our last webinar uh, on hydrology of the Salton Sea, um, Dr. Ajami's student talked a little about groundwater modeling, but they haven't done any detailed actual empirical work. So there's, I, I think, renewed interest in that, but um, certainly an opportunity there. And a, a, I think a lot of groundwater below this, uh, that potentially could be a source. But I think, you know, old growers is still, as I mentioned, they can do a more effective job, you know. But everything should be related to management. You know, the management here, it, it, it's a real uh, key player, you know. It's not all about the structures, not about, uh, you know, a lot of things about management. For example, you know, a growers think we can do leaching every other year. This is not just a talk. 
this is feasible because of very diverse cropping system we have in the desert. You know, we have sugar beet. Nowhere in California has sugar beet. Sugar beet is a very high tolerant, you know, salt crop. For example, this year I have onion. I do leaching for onion, but not if I, I want to plant next year, sugar beet, perhaps I don't need to do leaching this year. I think that's about management or growers can, can use some of those management and conserve some water, do a better job with leaching. And I, I think they are thinking about, because I'm, I'm going to Farm Bureau, always they are thinking about those things. I think they are the main player on this. With the structures, I don't know how far we can go. We are talking about half a million acres. I mean, that's, that's huge. The farming is huge. I think growers need to play a role here. And they are started, you know, they started to, to help on that. Thanks. Chris, any parting words? All right, just looking over the questions you had ahead of time, and one of them was whether the salts, the gypsum and the calcite would redissolve. And no, <laughs> our modeling showed that that would have to, the salinity levels would have to be much lower than seawater before we'd see any dilution there. And we're not going to see the, the morabolite, the sodiums, the sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, the various salts there up until we're probably 200,000 maybe, and Ellie could probably answer that better, but we're not close to the high end where we get to the salts that may dissolve and the ones that we're seeing now aren't, the calcium salts aren't going to redissolve. Um, part of the, the question I intended there was really to focus. Um, they're done. They're just saying goodbye. Yeah. What's up? Um, Misty, if you could mute. Um, so part of the question, Chris, was really not that the salt sea as a whole would uh, drop below ocean level salinity, but some of the, as they uh, impound uh, the fresher inflows in the rivers yeah. and drains. Well, that, and, and again, that, that, that almost that would be, I, I think that, that the answer would apply to those as well. They, they'd have to drop below sea level before anything would redissolve, before not below sea level, before the sea right. levels of salts, before they would redissolve. Thanks. Uh, and then Tom, just a quick last word. We're right at the top of the hour here. Sure, I'll just agree with Chris. The amount of uh, 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 calcium sulfate that re does redissolve, when I see it, is minimal. Uh, the great majority uh, stays as a solid. Uh, so the, you're not going to see substantial uh, redissolution of uh, of gypsum or anything else that's currently precipitating. Does calcite ever precipitate? It can. Yeah, we actually saw that in uh, in one of our uh, experiments uh, with uh, a membrane system where it was blocked up with calcium with with calcite after just a, a limited amount of um, of uh, concentration. Uh, so yeah, we uh, that uh, is uh, likely to uh, precipitate out. The calcite precipitation is fairly common in lakes, both freshwater and where we are now. So it should be precipitating. Yeah, it will come out before gypsum, and then typically. Um, well, I want to take a moment to thank all the panelists for giving above and beyond on the. Time, a lot of time allotted. So thanks very much for sharing your expertise and your time and um, thinking about the future here for the Salt and Sea and, uh, and looking north towards the Great Salt Lake, a lot to learn there as well. Uh, again, this webinar has been recorded, um, will be posted probably by tomorrow uh, at packin slash web, uh, I'm sorry, packin slash videos. Uh, and you'll be able to see all the slides there and, and the discussion. So with that, I want to thank everyone again, and thanks for joining in, and uh, stay tuned for another webinar, another Salt Sea subject, hopefully next month. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.